we're really excited to have uh, Ryan Abbott here. He is he's one of the most overqualified, uh, educated people that I know. He has an MD, a JD, a PhD, and uh, MTOM. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that is. Uh, he is a professor of law and health sciences at the University of Surrey, and also an adjunct and assistant professor of medicine at uh, UCLA. Uh, he's an author of a book, The Reasonable Robot, Artificial Intelligence and the Law. And what really excites me is that uh, he's part of the Daubis project, which uh, is actually trying to get patents on some of this technology, which I think he's gonna tell us a little bit uh, about today. So with that, I'm gonna keep my introduction short so that we can have more time for the panel uh, at the end. And again, we're changing up the schedule a little bit. I'm gonna take away five minutes at the question session so that we can add that to the uh, panelist section at the end. All right, with that, why don't you go ahead and take it away, Ryan? Well, thank you, Sean. I'll do my best to keep them to 20 minutes. And the MTOM is an acupuncture degree, which believe it or not in California took four years to get. If we were doing this in person, it drinks the needles would be coming out, but we're not. So we'll just stick to the AI here. Excellent. AI is doing some pretty cool stuff these days, um, from making music that doesn't sound half bad to writing short articles that people can't tell were written by a machine, to doing interesting sorts of things in research and development. At the end of last year, uh, DeepMind, which is a company owned by Google's parent Alphabet, announced that they had an AI AlphaFold that had dramatically outcompeted other teams at an annual challenge related to predicting protein folding. Essentially, they would give the teams a two-dimensional protein sequence, and the teams would have to predict what that protein would look like in three dimensions. And while that may have been a little less dramatic than developing an AI to beat the world champion of the game Go, it has a lot more practical importance because predicting protein folding can be a key aspect of drug discovery. And so it could be that you know this AI or human AI team predicting protein folding could be the foundation underlying a new important a, a new patent on a new drug or at least a trade secret related to a new drug and if the end of last year is too far away this month a team from google published in the journal nature that they had designed an ai using deep reinforcement learning that was able to design a chip floor plan which is the layout of components on a computer chip it's a process that normally takes a multidisciplinary group of people months to do. It took the AI six hours, and the team reported the AI did a dramatically better job than the human team, including it designing chips that would go on to form the hardware of AI systems. Uh, and chip floor plans are a little bit specialized in the US, but are also traditionally the subject of intellectual property protection. Incidentally, in my research, the earliest example I could find of people saying that an AI-generated invention had received a patent was from the 1980s at Stanford, and that was for a more conventional expert system that essentially designed a chip floor plan. It was provided schematics of chip floor plans, it used heuristics, designed a chip floor plan that no one had expected and that appeared to be useful, and Stanford filed a patent on it. They ultimately abandoned that application for unrelated reasons, but AI has been doing this for a long time, but it's getting pretty good at it. This is a case study that Siemens presented in 2019 at the WIPO first conversation on AI and IP. And these are two car suspensions. Yes, two car suspensions. I have subsequently learned what these things are. The one on the left <clears throat> is a conventional one, and the one on the right is one that came out of an AI after a team of engineers presented an AI with a bunch of schematics on car suspensions, told it what they were looking for in terms of fitness criteria and the AI output of this design. Siemens wanted to file for a patent on this, but found that they couldn't when none of the engineers involved in the project were willing to say that they had invented this thing. They said essentially they just fed publicly available data to the AI, told it what they were looking for broadly. They all recognized this had value and none of them had done anything inventive. And that isn't just vanity on behalf of an engineer, although maybe there is some of that. In the US, it is a criminal offense to deliberately misrepresent yourself as an inventor on a patent application. You know, but the net effect of this is that Siemens had something that they considered industrially valuable and they couldn't get a patent on it because of the role AI had played. 
All of this activity has not passed unnoticed by patent offices, some of which you heard earlier today. At the end of 2019, around the same time, the US PTO announced two requests for comments on, on patenting AI inventions and also non-patent IP issues related to AI and IP. They published a report last year based on some of the comments to these, you know, largely finding that the system was okay as it was with perhaps some tweaks needed. Uh, the UK IPO last year issued a similar sort of request for comments and published their report this year. That report was a little more open-minded about some of the challenges AI was going to pose to IP and some potential suggestions that might help the IP system work better. And there's been a flurry in recent years of official and semi-official reports and analyses on some of the issues with AI and IP. Uh, a couple of months ago, the US National Security Commission on AI published a substantial report. This wasn't just focused on AI and IP and it, its finding was essentially that the US was falling behind in the AI arms race and, and substantial investments were needed. One line from this here, America is not prepared to defend or compete in the AI era. This is the tough reality we must face. I think my video screen's cutting off the right side of it, but the gist of it is we need, you know, some ambitious industrial strategy plan. And they do have a full chapter devoted to AI and IP and how AI and IP is a issue of national security as well as industrial strategy, focusing in part on traditional issues that AI has made more interesting or at least got people talking about again, computer implemented inventions, which have really never left the radar but have taken on some new importance in light of AI, uh, protection of data or databases or data per se, because AI can make new uses of large data sets and also data can be used to train AI in valuable sorts of ways. And then it does function on some of the more um, topical issues in AI and IP like inventorship by AI. Um, the European Commission also a couple of months ago released a new draft regulations on AI that wasn't so much on IP, but is part of the overall push for more regulation, at least in the European Commission on AI issues. And of course, WIPO has been hosting its conversation on AI and artificial intelligence. They're going into their fourth session focused on data soon. Uh, WIPO has put forth a issues paper, which has also been the subject of comments and revised. WIPO is doing less to try and solve some of these problems or propose solutions to them, and it's doing more to help encourage dialogue among stakeholders and between member states. Uh, both to do with, as you heard in the last track, AI as it is being used by patent offices, AI as it is being used by applicants, and of course, kind of new interesting issues that AI and IP are raising. And there are a whole lot of very interesting issues that AI raises with respect to IP. Uh, in trademarks, for example, as programs like Siri are out shopping for people, AI may be stepping into the shoes of the reasonable consumer and changing how trademarks are used. Um, use of IP by AI and whether that is infringement and on whom. Uh, use of copywritten materials by AI, text and data mining exemptions, um, whether using AI, I, uh, copywritten material to train AI should be a infringement. Uh, and of course, in the patent space, there's a number of interesting issues. The one that I want to focus on because it's near and dear to my heart is what happens as in the Siemens case when you have an otherwise patentable invention that lacks a traditional human inventor. That's what we had in two test cases, which we engineered as part of what we're calling the artificial inventor project, although some people do call it the Davis cases. So, um, you know, that just shows how good I am at marketing. Uh, but this is a PCT application that was published, and you, you can see here the applicant and owner of the patent application and any issued patents, presumptively, would be Stephen Thaler, who is the owner of an AI named Dabis. Inventor here is listed as Dabis. The invention was generated by an artificial intelligence, which is a long first name, but a fairly descriptive one. Uh, I want to talk a bit about what's going on with this case before which I want to just kind of briefly explain how it is that a machine could do something like this. This is an earlier version of Dabis essentially from the 1990s, which involves at least two neural networks. The first neural network is trained on data. So let's say you show it chip floor plans. It essentially stores this data by altering connection weights between artificial neurons represented as connection weights in those gray lines. I really have to stop pointing at PowerPoints on Zoom, but there's gray lines there. Those represent connection weights between artificial neurons. 
and the weight changes it's exposed to data. So it will essentially store these chip floor plans, it's seen. It then alters its own connection weights, which corrupts the data it has seen, and it essentially spits out some different chip floor plans. If you train a second network, a critic neural network, on what the first network has seen and what it hasn't, it can say, well, what is coming out right now is novel. And if you tell it some things that you're looking for, like I want a computer chip that uses half as much electricity, it can identify when something has value. That was an early iteration of the machine. Uh, today's iteration uses hundreds or thousands of neural networks instead of two. Each neural network um, stores essentially for a concept which can be represented linguistically. So for example, uh, a neural network can represent an academic or a lecturer or a teacher or an educator. Uh, these connect to other neural networks and at early stages, the machine is mentored or trained in forming basic concepts like academics are boring or, you know, gee, I can't think of any other basic concept between academics are boring, you know, cars go fast, academics are boring and cars that go fast. And then in um, unmentored stages at later points of this, the machine connects basic com concepts together to make more complex ones and essentially produces then patent claims in, in more or less natural language. In one instance, it suggested a beverage container based on fractal geometry. So like, like a snail shell that could be useful for storage or transportation or grip. And in another example, it came up with a flashing light that could att help attract human attention uh, in an emergency or AI attention in an emergency. Now, what's different about this from a patent perspective from a subsistence inventorship and ownership perspective is we didn't have a person, although there were people involved in this invention, no one who would traditionally qualify as an inventor, at least under US or UK jurisprudence, because uh, no problem was selected to be solved. Sometimes selecting a problem to be solved can make someone an inventor, but not normally. Normally we're solving for known problems like how do you make a better computer chip floor plan? How do you make a better car suspension? Uh, training a machine with specific data to solve a specific problem might also make someone an inventor. You know, for example, if you are programming an AI to find a cure for COVID and very carefully feeding it training data, but that wasn't done here. Uh, and identifying inventive output might also be something that makes someone an inventor. So if that AI to cure COVID said, here's 10 possible antibodies, go test them, find the one that works best. I think there's a very strong claim for someone being an inventor. If the machine says you just present it with the COVID antigen and it says, here's the antibody that will treat it. Here's how to do the clinical trials. Here's the supporting data you want. And here it is formatted as a patent application. A lot less clear there's anyone who has exercised any inventive skill with respect to that. And here, both of these inventions were obviously useful. There wasn't, at least before our case, a lot of law on this. There was more law on the issue of computer-generated works and copyright protection. Uh, the UK was the first country in 1988 to explicitly provide for this sort of protection, although uh, a few other jurisdictions do this as well. So when you have an AI-generated work that otherwise qualifies for copyright protection but lacks a traditional human author, uh, the way as might be the case if you go and use some commercially open source AI to make a picture like this or make a new song. The producer of the work is legally deemed to be the author. That is a producer like a film producer, someone who undertakes to have the work made. And it receives a shortened period of protection, 50 years instead of 70 years plus the life of an author, which doesn't make sense with AI because AI doesn't die and also doesn't live. And also who needs 70 years plus life other than Disney, but anyway. The US has gone in the opposite directions, formally since at least 1973. That's not a statute, that's a US copyright office policy, which they're now calling their human authorship policy. And they're citing to the 1884 maybe case of Borough Giles v. Cerrone in support of that policy. Uh, that was a case involving this famous picture of Oscar Wilde before the Supreme Court, where it was an open question at that point whether a photograph could receive copyright protection and the Supreme Court that held that any tangible expression by which ideas and the means of an author are given expression or something like that are eligible for protection, that includes things like photographs. But according to the Copyright Office, doesn't include things made by AI because AI doesn't have a mind and neither does a monkey. 
Uh, this policy was almost challenged in court a few years ago as part of the monkey selfies case. This is a series of pictures taken of itself by a black crested macaque named Naruto pictured here. Naruto is not happy. Uh, showing teeth is a display of aggression amongst macaques. So this is Naruto seeing its own reflection and trying to intimidate the macaque it is seeing. Uh, the photographer who owned the camera under questionable circumstances uh, tried to commercialize the photograph. People used it without his permission. The issue of whether this could be copyright infringement seemed to resolve when the copyright office explicitly stated photographs taken by monkeys can't get copyright protection. Then PETA sued in district court in California arguing that Naruto was the owner of the copyright and they would administer the lawsuit on his behalf. That case was dismissed in the Ninth Circuit, but not, on, not to do with the merits of the copyright office policy, it was dismissed on standing. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, unless Congress is going to very plainly state that monkeys have standing to sue, then monkeys don't have standing to sue. So we'll see what happens with that. In the meantime, we've got a little more law related to the question of whether an AI can be, um, or whether you can get protection for an AI generated invention. The reason when we filed this, we named the AI as the inventor for a few reasons. One, to inform the public this was an AI generated invention. Uh, two, to prevent someone from taking credit for work they hadn't done. So if Dr. Thaler licensed me Davis and I could have it invent 10,000 things, it would change the meaning of human inventorship and discredit legitimate human ingenuity for me to get to say I had invented 10,000 things. Um, and there's another reason we named the AI, but it's escaping me at the moment. Of course, no one that I'm aware of, and certainly not us, has suggested that the AI would own a patent, which you know it wouldn't for a variety of reasons, least of which because it wouldn't make sense, it wouldn't be a good idea. But Dr. Thaler is the owner of the AI is, we are alleging the applicant and owner of the patent. And we allege that on the basis of common law doctrines of accession or first possession, essentially if you own a fruit tree, you own the fruit that comes from that tree, uh, the fruit tree doesn't need to assign you the fruit. It just automatically, your title derives from virtue of owning the property. And what else should I say about this case? We filed this case in a little more than a dozen jurisdictions right now. It has been rejected from the US, the UK, Europe, Germany, and Australia at the moment. Uh, all of these are under appeal. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll move a little faster. We recently had a hearing at the Eastern District of Virginia, and the argument essentially there is based on federal circuit jurisprudence about whether a natural person has to be an inventor. That jurisprudence, though, was with respect to companies potentially being inventors or sovereigns. You know, that is different because companies are literally composed of people and, and AI, of course, isn't. Um, so the issues are a bit different. And also as a question of statutory interpretation, whether the Patents Act uses terms like individuals and whether that, well, it does, and whether that has to refer to a natural person or it could be something broader. Um, in the UK, next month, we have a hearing at the Court of Appeal, which is the second highest court in the UK. It was rejected our appeal at the High Court, although the judge in that case suggested one way to potentially protect this would be to name Dr. Thaler as the inventor simply by virtue of owning Davis rather than any inventive activity he did. We declined to advance that position uh, and we will see what happens next month. It is also set for a hearing in December at the EPO Board of Appeal. The EPO president has been saying nice things about the case and has just made a written intervention this month in it. If anyone's curious about these cases, I made a website, artificialinventor.com, which links to all the cases and what's going on from time to time when I feel like updating it. Um, so we're gonna have some interesting decisions until then. Uh, my prediction on this though, is that in the next few years, you, you heard earlier about whether lawmakers will get involved in this. I, I think some jurisdictions will end up protecting this under one theory or another. You know, among other things, some EPO member states like Cyprus and Monaco have reported they do not require inventors to be natural persons. Israel does not require an inventor to be listed in an application. You can just apply as an applicant and not list someone's name. And other jurisdictions will issue patents on the basis of a PCT application. So um, food for thought. And I was gonna talk a bit but I guess I'll just do it in like one minute about how AI is going to change some other interesting things in patent law, like the person having ordinary skill in the art. 
as people increasingly use AI as average researchers, this should make average researchers more knowledgeable because they can access more prior art reasonably and more sophisticated because they can do interesting things like pattern recognition and big data sets that they couldn't do unaided. So I think that AI is likely to increase the standard under which we grant patents or raise the bar to getting a patent. At some point when, you know, essentially instead of going to teams of research scientists when we want a new vaccine, Moderna and Pfizer and AstraZeneca just all go to AIs and ask, you know, what's the best vaccine for this? Then essentially the person skilled in the art is either an AI or someone using an AI. And I think that really significantly raises the bar to this because there are going to be few limits in the future on what an AI won't find obvious. And whoever came up with the term not obvious really made it difficult to use in conversation. Um, but I think I will just leave on that note. And thank you very much for the time and look forward to five minutes of questions. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I am going to, to uh, remind those uh, in, who are in attendance to use the Q&A function of the uh, Zoom dial to uh, post your questions. And then I will ask them uh, as they come up um, it, right it, it, now. Looks like we've got a legacy. What's the difference between CPRO one range and CCI range? I think 42 is the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so with that, to kind of keep us on schedule, I'm gonna move to, to Kate right now. Uh, and if you have questions, please just use the Q&A function and uh, uh, Ryan can answer those questions uh, on the Q&A in written format. 